chapter make clear three pertinent ideas. That we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. That probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. That God could and would if we were sought. Okay, now let's have a hand for our first speaker, Alana. Hi, everybody. My name's Alana, and I'm an alcoholic. <sighs> Before I get self-obsessed, I really want to thank Willis for asking me to come out and um, share my story with you. Um, this is my favorite meeting. I try to make it here every Saturday. And um, thank you, Mo Moira, for... Uh, that was a brilliant chapter five. Um, wow. <clears throat> when I got sober, um, wow, I was just like that. Um, I started drinking when I was 13, and the first time I ever picked up a drink, I went into a blackout. And the last time I ever took a drink, I was in a blackout, and I was very much a blackout drinker. Um, I don't know what it's like to have a social drink, a glass of wine, and put it down and, like, you know, cross my legs and leave the table, you know. Um, <clears throat> by the time I was 23 years old, I'd been to jail seven or eight times. Um, I went to jail for my first DUI when I was 17 years old, and I thought it was really funny, and, and um, I was working at a bar as a cocktail waitress underage, and, and um, I was sleeping with the manager because that's the kind of tools that I had to <laughs> live with when I was using. And I remember getting pulled over, and it was really funny to me. I don't know why, but it just was like, woo, I'm getting pulled over, whatever. And um, <clears throat> I got out of the car, and they had me do these series of tests and everything. And um, he asked me to say the ABCs backwards. And, um, and I just was like, I'm dyslexic. So you could think it was an easy job for me or something, but it was completely mind-boggling that he wanted me to do this. And so I stood up, and I walked backwards, and I went A, B, C, D. And he did not think that was very funny, but his partner was cracking up. And I was just like, oh, and, you know, Miss Downey, put your hands behind your back. You're going to jail, whatever. And um, I remember hitchhiking home the next day when I got out of jail, and I remember very clearly as it was yesterday. I was a um, Jack Daniels drinker out of the bottle, and... Um, I remember swigging a big old chug of Jack Daniels and doing a couple lines, and I was like calling my friends going, wow, I spent the night in jail, man. I thought it was really cool, 17 years old. This is what I thought I was. Alcoholism is a progressive disease. The next time I got pulled over for a DUI, it wasn't that funny. I was in a blackout, and I remember it was New Year's Eve, and um, I got pulled over, and I don't remember what happened, but I remember I came to as a billy club was being swatted at my head. And I remember going, whoa, I mean, it can't, you can't just say, excuse me, can you just hold on a minute because I just got here, do you know what I mean? Like, I just woke up. <laughs> can I ask a couple of questions before you do that again because it really hurts? Um, <clears throat> and I remember going into this little jail in Banning, California, which I don't think anybody wants to be at. <laughs> and uh, I was in this little padded cell thing and... and um, I read the report the next day, and I guess I started beating up the, the, the woman police officer. <laughs> she reminded me of my mother or something. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I was a violent drunk. And what happened was it wasn't funny saying the ABCs backwards. It started to become a very progressive illness for Milana. By the time I was 23 years old, I got busted for cocaine. I got a third DUI, and my life was a wreck. I completely just shut down. Um, school got in the way. I had to quit school because I had to deal drugs. You know, um, I dealt pounds of marijuana and cocaine across the country because that's what I thought I had to do, you know? Those are the, this is how I had to live my life. Um, right before <clears throat> my 23rd birthday, um, I had a really shitty childhood, which I don't get into because it's just the way it is, you know? I, I went into a foster home when I was one. I lived there until I was eight. I was beaten, molested, whatever. I had a really shitty childhood. I'm not a victim of that today, and it was a really terrible thing that that happened to me, but I try not to place that upon you guys or myself anymore, because I live in today, I live in now. 
And um, I never really knew my mom or my dad. They just dropped me off at a doorstep and basically picked me up like eight years later. And um, when I started living with my mom and my stepdad, they got married and um, I was about 17 at the time and my stepdad was 20 and um, I was dating a 30 year old. So it was kind of like a weird thing going on with me and my mom. And um, I didn't like him. I was like a hardcore rocker girl and you know, I was like wearing concert t-shirts and bands and he was wearing preppy t-shirts, alligators and topsiders and he really bugged me. And um, <laughs> We got in a fight, blah, blah, blah. You know, it just didn't work out between my mom and, and me. We just had these differences. She was my best friend when a, mom wasn't around, when a guy wasn't around. And when a guy was around, I was basically outcast. And um, right before my 23rd birthday, I hadn't talked to her or my stepfather in about five years. And um, I just got done partying that night. <clears throat> and um, I was living in Palm Springs at the time. And I was a cocktail waitress and a drug dealer. And um, I was up all night, and I got a phone call from the Sun Valley, Idaho Sheriff Department. And um, they asked it, you know, if it was me on the phone. I said, yeah. And, and uh, they said that they were sorry to inform me, but my mom and my stepdad had been killed. And um, <sighs> my whole world shifted. And um, I figured they traveled a lot. They got in a car accident. And what ended up happening was he's, he murdered my mother, and then he shot himself. And um, I'm a very, um, by nature, I'm a very shut down, closed off person. I drink to shut down, I close off, I don't want to be around you, I don't want to look you in the eye, I don't want to get close to you. And when that happened, um, I made a conscious decision to never love a human being as long as I lived. And I took that well into my fifth year of sobriety. And um, three months later, um, right, be right after my 23rd birthday, I got um, pulled over for my third DUI, and that was by the grace of God. And I was pending a year and a half in prison, and I was 210 pounds, and I had purple spiky hair, and I hated the world. I had the eyes of just Satan, <laughs> and um, I had the heart that just clamped closed. And um, through my series of drinking, I remember this guy, Gary, coming into my bar, and I'd always give him the same thing, a greyhound and a little bit of cocaine underneath the napkin, and, you know, one day he disappeared, and he didn't show up for like six months in my bar, and I remember he'd come in, and he'd come walking in my dark bar, and he was like glowing and smiling, and I was like, whew, dude, you look like you need a drink. What's up? And I shoved him his greyhound. He goes, no, I don't drink any, I don't use anymore. And I said, you don't what? He goes, I'm clean and sober. And I go, you're what? He goes, I'm clean and sober. And I was like, what's that? I never even heard that term, clean and sober. <laughs> the hell is that? It sounds scary. He goes, I'm in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I haven't had a drink in six months, and my life is amazing. And I just wanted to let you know that my life is ama amazing, and I'm, I'm okay. And he walked out. He didn't shove the program down my throat. He didn't tell me I was an alcoholic. He didn't tell me anything about me. He just told me about him. And the night, July 22nd, 1988, I was sitting in that cold cement <clears throat> jail cell, and I remembered his name. And I called information, and I got him on the phone, and I said I was scared, and I was lonely, and I was afraid, and I wanted to die. My mom was gone. My stepdad was gone. I had no family. I never talked to my dad. I'm going to jail for a really long time, and I don't want to go, and I'm afraid. And he said, you know what, Alana, the minute you get out, and you'll get out tonight, try to not pick up a drink and a drug just for 24 hours and go to an AA meeting. And I was like, for 24 hours? <laughs> Are you serious? He goes, yeah, just do it. I go, what's that going to do for me? He goes, just trust me. And I said, okay. And so on July 23rd, 1988, I walked up the, the steps of the North Shore Alana Club in San Diego, and I've been sober since that day. And let me tell you, it's been a journey <laughs> and a half. My first year of sobriety consisted of picking up trash on the side of the roads with purple hair and an orange vest and an orange hat. And I was 210 pounds, and I looked like a big tent. And I used to walk around... And I picked up this trash, and I remember, like, two months before, I was in, in front of the judge, you know, pleading my, you know, please don't let me go to prison. I'm a really nice girl. Like, he cares. And um, he said I had to go to drinking and driving school. I had to pick up trash and do all this community service work, and I had to um, go to lockdown unit at Descanso Work Farm on the weekend. So basically, seven days a week, I was theirs. And I'm grateful, because seven days a week, my head is going strong. And um, I was picking up trash on the side of the road in Encinitas, and I remember getting really ungrateful. And I don't know what that term meant, but I remember being uncomfortable going, what am I doing? I'd see all my friends driving by and honking the horn and flashing the peace sign, woo-hoo, going surfing. I was like, fuck you. And, um, 
And I remember being pissed off, and then all of a sudden, something happened to me, and I closed my eyes, and I can smell the eucalyptus trees, and I felt the sunlight on my face and that breeze of the ocean, and I never remember. I remember, like, ether in the closet. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't remember that kind of stuff. And um, I got grateful. And I, I call that a moment of clarity. And all of a sudden, I started picking up trash on the side of the road, and I started singing zippity doo dah, <laughs> zippity doo dah. And I was excited, and something changed for Alana. And that's when the, the, the whole progression of Alana's life started to change. Um, I turned five years sober, and um, my first five years consisted of basically being alone. I spent a lot of time alone. I spent a lot of time in meetings, and I spent a lot of time doing my inventory. And um, I met a guy named Gino, and um, he had long hair, and he was a Mexican, and he had the sunlight of spirit in his eyes. And I walked up to him, and I asked him to be my sponsor, and he said, men work with men, and women work with women. And I was really righteous then, because I read the big book. I mean, I didn't do it too well, because I had dyslexia, but I had that dictionary, and I read word for word. And I said, I don't see where it says men work with men, and women work with women, this big book. I don't like women. I don't trust women. women. Women have abused me my whole life. I need you to sponsor me, or else I'm going to drink. And he's like, oh, we can talk about it. Let's just talk about it. <laughs> and I was like, all right. And that man became my sponsor, and he stayed my sponsor until I turned eight years sober. And that man saved my life. That man taught me the Lord's Prayer. He taught me how to be alive, how to look at people in the eyes, how to say that I cared. He taught me that he wasn't going to leave me. You know, he said, I have one question for you. Are you willing to go to any lengths to stay sober, no matter what? And I said, yeah, I am. And he worked every single step, 12 steps, 12 traditions, and 12 concepts with me. And I, my life changed right before my eyes. And um, when I turned five years sober, I did a second inventory um, and everything, because when I was new, I didn't remember a whole lot. I was a blackout drinker. So when I turned five years sober, I remembered a whole lot. And my life changed, man. Let me tell you, I was hanging on like you wouldn't believe. And um, I met a girl at a coffee house named Vanessa, and um, she came walking up to me. Hi, I'm Vanessa. And I was like, yeah, who fucking cares? Fuck you. And she walked away. And I went home, and I was like, why did I do that? Why am I so mean to people like that? Why am I mean to beautiful women? Like, what is that? And I went home, and I wrote about it, because that's what Gino taught me how to do. And I wrote about it, and what I realized, and where am I selfish, dishonest, self singing afraid, was she was beautiful, and I didn't feel that. She had the things that I thought I needed and wanted to be okay with myself. But the truth was, I am okay with myself. And I went up to her at the old late-night meeting, and I tapped her on the shoulder, and I said, I'm really sorry. Can we talk? And she started to cry, and I said, I'm so sorry that I did that to you. You're gorgeous, you're beautiful, you seem like you have your shit together, and I don't feel like that inside. And um, I judged you because I'm jealous. And she started to cry, and she, I said, why are you crying? And she said, is this what Alcoholics Anonymous is about? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, I have 30 days sober today, and nobody's ever apologized for being nice to me. I became that woman's sponsor, and we became best friends, and she's still my best friend to this day. And... Um, what started to happen for me was my heart broke, and it broke open. And I started to trust a woman, and I started to trust a human being. And when I made that conscious decision of never trusting you again, for me to trust one inch of my life to tell the truth to you, from the bottom of my heart, it started to change for me. And um, I'm going to wrap it up with what happened to me this year. <clears throat> this has been a really rough year for me. Um, because I... I was able to open my heart and have an amazing, beautiful life. Um, I met a guy. <laughs> and um, I got married last year. And um, two months later, I got annulled. And um, the truth is, is I got to feel what it felt like to be me. I got to feel what it felt like to let another human being touch my heart. But I also got to learn that I don't take abuse no matter what. And it doesn't matter if you're clean and sober or if you're drinking and using. There's things that I believe in that are serious boundaries that I will never let people cross. And if I let you cross this much, then I'm compromising. And I have no ounce of inside of me to compromise anymore. I've done it in my whole life. And you can't cheat on me and you can't physically or emotionally abuse me. And that's what happened. And um, I left. And I got an annulment. And then three months later, I got a new car and I got in a car accident. Somebody sideswiped me. And then a couple of months later, I got the chicken pox. And then a couple of months later, I got a phone call, and my sponsor had gotten loaded after 16 and a half years sober. 
And then a couple of months later, one of my best friends died. And it just kept going and going. And, and every single time I picked myself up, I dusted myself off, I went to a meeting and I called my friends and said, I need help today because I don't think I can stay sober. And they said, you know what, Alana, I know you can. You stayed clean and sober for 10 years. I think you can do it one more day. It doesn't matter if you have 30 days, one day, 10 years, or 20 years. We're all alcoholics. We all have today, and that's it. And man, I just wanted to just die this year. And what happened to me was a spiritual awakening. When I had the chicken pox, I had two weeks by myself. And I couldn't let anybody around me, and I couldn't go outside, and I got really close with me, and I got really close with God. And what I realized that is that I'm okay with me. I'm perfectly okay with Alana. And what I learned in that relationship was I had to completely discover who I was not to discover who I am. And this is a long journey of alcoholism. This is a long journey of life and love. Um, <sighs> my life is amazing today. I can look at myself in the mirror and I can look at myself deep in the eye into my heart and know that I love myself. And I can look at you in the eye and say that I care. And I never cared before. I didn't care. And today I do. Um, I, lo I owe my life to Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I hope you have a good evening. Our group is self-supporting through our own contributions. We will now observe the seventh tradition. Please remain seated. This is not a break. While the baskets are being passed, we have a few announcements from our co-secretary, Aaron. You okay? Hi, you guys. I'm Aaron. I'm an addict alcoholic. <clears throat> Co-secretary's announcements. <sighs> Let's see here. Please be as generous as you can with the seventh, seventh tradition. We try to present a quality meeting here, and this is expensive. We provide child care free of charge. This and all other expenses are paid for out of your donations. If you'd like to tape the tape, if you'd like to tip the babysitter, there's a can here to do that. There is, there is a custom at this meeting, which is strictly voluntary. If you are celebrating a birthday with us here tonight and would like to donate a dollar for each year of sobriety, please use this can. We also ask that birthday people limit their sharing to one minute. We, we tape this meeting and have tapes available for sale. They make great gifts. If you'd like to buy a tape, see Christopher by the literature after the meeting. Now I have to tell you the rules. Alcoholics Anonymous does not own this facility, so we have to respect the wishes of the people who do the Malibu Santa Monica Unified School District. We risk losing this meeting if we don't comply and they're always mad at us. First, there is no smoking anywhere on the grounds. This is an elementary school and we ask that you respect that. If you need to smoke, you have to do it at the curbside out the door to my right. Please use the butt cans provided. You may also smoke in your car if you are the antisocial type and don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> Second is about seat saving. After 6.30 p.m., you may save a seat for yourself and one other person. We start setting up at 6 p.m. and can always use the help. If you want to make sure you have a seat, show up early and help set up the meeting. Finally, about the parking. We have two large parking lots which provide more than adequate parking. We have agreed not to park on the street. If you have to, if you've parked on one, on the, if you've parked on the street, please move your car into one of the lots at the break. A small lot by the kitchen is for the people with commitments. If you would like to park there, see Willis or myself, and we will give you a commitment. We recycle at this meeting, so if you buy soda or water at the break, please recycle in the can we have provided in the kitchen. At the end of the break, you will hear a bell. This is our halftime herder. Please return to your seats promptly so we can hear the 12 traditions and to give our main speaker, who usually has come a long way to speak here, enough time to speak. Thank you for letting me be of service. All the birthday people and the cake givers, please come up to the stage.
<laughs> hey, Mark, what up, dude? Okay. All right. Rachel, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, we celebrate birthdays with a candle for each 365 days of continuous sobriety. Tonight we have five birthdays, or six birthdays. Um, um, we will sing happy birthday to them all. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rachel. Happy birthday to you. 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 Happy Rachel, I'm an alcoholic. It's really funny, whenever we come to open speaker meetings with my parents, people always think I'm an LAT. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to say. This is, this is my first meeting here, but yeah, this has been the longest year of my life. <laughs> um, a year ago, I went into treatment because I thought I had a brain tumor and manic depression. Um, I didn't think that I had a problem because, yeah, I don't, I don't know why I thought that, because, yeah, I had no school, no friends, no life. Um, this is after my last haircut. I finally got the hair dye out, so I understand. <laughs> my mom is really grateful for that, but, um, yeah, it's, it's hard lately, because I've been, like, I talked to a lot of people, and they said it's pretty normal for a year, any birthday, just, like, the wanting to use and um, drink and even smoke, because I haven't smoked in a year, and, it's hard, too, because of my age, but I think it's that way with anybody. It's like the next year I'll be like, oh, but now it's even harder because I'm older or something. I don't know, but um, it's I owe it to God and people like you because, like, I just met Rio yesterday, and she already she offered to take me to a meeting, and she gave me my cake and everything, but, yeah, just thank you. Um, our second birthday is for Richard. Stacy, Matt, and Mark will give him his cake. Yeah. Better do this. Hi, I'm Richard, alcoholic. Hey, Richard. Um, I've been trying to. Uh, get sober for about four years now and uh, I finally managed to put together a year which is uh, which is incredible and um, I'm just really uh, I'm just really grateful um, that uh, there are people around that that really care about me and um, they've taught me that uh, it's okay to to care about myself also um, I'd like to thank my wife Stacy um, Matt, Mark, um, Bob, and everybody at uh, Exodus for uh, pointing me in the right direction. Thanks very much. Okay, our third birthday is for five years for Ross and John. We'll give him this cake. I'm Ross, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Ross. Five years and not one tattoo. <laughs> I'd like to thank John for my cake. I love you, man. You rule. I, I, I met John, uh, I had like two months, and he was taking a five-year cake, and he was telling his friends he loved him, and that made a big impression on me, you know? It's like Alana was saying, like my heart was clamped shut, and I was such fear and insecurity, and he was expressing that, and I was like, how do you do that, you know? 
So five years later, I love you, man. You rule. <laughs> so um, I, I take cake just to show the newcomer that you can achieve consistent sobriety, you know, and I did a lot of things I don't want to do, the steps, um, <laughs> meetings, you know, just doing, doing that because I want to be here, you know. I mean, I looked at someone with five years and I was going, what? That's not attainable. And it's just one day at a time, you know, or, or it's 90 days, 20 times in a row, if you want to think of it that way. That's it. Thank you. Okay, our next birthday is for uh, eight years for Rick and Clark. We'll give him his cake. Oh, boy, it's been a rough, uh, rough go this last year, but uh, I'll tell you, I'm Rick, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, very happy uh, Clark gave it to me. I, I got here three years ago and uh, had a real tight program before and developed a lot of good habits, and they've served me really well. I not only know a lot today, I really believe a lot, and um, I have a lot of good habits in place that have you know, let me put one step in front of the other. <clears throat> but I, I really felt like a fish out of water here in California coming from the East Coast. And, you know, it's so cool here. Everybody's so cool with a lot of facades. And, you know, I'm kind of in your face. And people don't appreciate that. They don't understand me, make fun of me. But anyways, uh, uh, kind of settling in and getting comfortable. And uh, uh, so many things I can point to the program. Uh, basically came very shut down like our speaker was talking about and um, today I can love I you know I, I can feel my feelings today I can cry I can uh, you know laugh I you know, whole whole range of feelings and I really have to uh, thank you guys uh, for teaching me uh, and showing me more importantly and, uh, so thanks Our next birthday is for Mary for 15 years, and Rebecca will give her her cake. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and um, I want to thank Rebecca for giving me my cake. We've been friends uh, for several years, and she's just been an incredibly supportive person. Um, I'm so grateful I'm sober. Both my mother and father died of this disease. My father died four months ago of this disease, and a man I was involved with for many years died a month ago of this disease. Um, you know, it, this disease kills. And I was almost dead when I got here, and um, I had a second chance. And I know my daughter's really grateful. <laughs> And I'm, I'm just so grateful to be alive. Um, and I couldn't, I wouldn't be alive without this program, without uh, all the support of the fellowship. I tried getting sober on my own. I was going back and forth from here in Detroit in the early 80s, and I, was, I got sober in a, in a sweat lodge. And, um, but I had no fellowship, you know, and I'd go back to Detroit and there'd be, uh, there was no one except all the people I used with, and m my husband got remarried in my house. With my daughter's the only attendant, and I couldn't deal with it. And I went out for another year and a half, and, and it got much worse. I almost died, so I had, didn't have to be convinced when I came in. It kills. If you come here, you can stay alive. Thanks. Okay, and our last birthday is for 35 years for Al. Mark and Betsy will give them a start.
It's good. <laughs> it doesn't say William Hargraves on there, or it doesn't say Harry Gerwitz. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alan, I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. I want to thank my friend Mark and his fiance Betty for giving me a cake. I've sponsored Mark for probably about 15 years. A little longer. A little longer, I mean, and it's been hard, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I'm really happy for him, and he's really got a lovely fiance. I really like her. They're a great couple. And I want to thank my wife for um, being her wonderful little self in my life like she is. We have such a... Um, it's, this program's incredible. I mean, what, uh, what can come out of it? I mean, I just put $35 in the, in the tin. My rent when I came on the program was a dollar more than that a month. <laughs> and, and I couldn't make the rent, man. You know what I mean? But I got around it. I subleased my room to another guy, part of the room, and the two of us guys couldn't make the rent. You know? So I'm really grateful for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm grateful for the steps, and I'm grateful for the sponsor, uh, for, uh, for the sponsor I have, and I'm grateful for the guys who, uh, who uh, get to be part of their life because they really, they really inspire me. I was at Promises last night, and I got to meet these guys and girls there. And they're really inspiring. They're really brave. And it really gives you, it makes you feel good to know that, you know, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves in the place for good things to happen. Because we put ourselves in the place for good things to happen doesn't mean our mom isn't going to die. It doesn't mean my dad's not going to die. It doesn't mean my daughter's not going to die or my dog's not going to die. What it means is I'm putting myself in a good place to happen and I can live my life. And all I have to do is trust in God and be willing to clear away the wreckage of the past. And uh, there's no, and uh, I, we're just not going to live happily ever after because there's no, uh, all we're going to do is we're going to live now and just kind of, and that's the trick is to hang out in your underwear, you know. If I figured out if I really want to know where I'm at, I just check my underwear. That's where I'm at. Don't ask your head. Your head will only tell you where you should be or where you were. And it... And it really does know what it's talking about, you know. So I love you guys, and thank you. We have a great main speaker. Oh, uh, it's time for a brief coffee, ten-minute coffee break, five-minute coffee break. I don't know, whatever. It's not a right or wrong thing far as I'm concerned, or a good or bad thing. It's just a fact. I'm an alcoholic. The disease is called alcoholism. The condition is called alcoholic. Uh, I haven't got a clue where I'm going to start. <sighs> you really moved me. You really did. Um, We have a similar uh, past, um, except I had a lot of family. I, I come from a family, 97 first cousins. All the men were Catholic in the bedroom. Uh, Toronto, Canada. Mom had 18 brothers and sisters. They all had at least five kids. Um, the women ended up in basements doing laundry and their feet turning yellow with calluses. And the, men's, the men pretty well were laboring class. and. Drank on Friday nights because they deserved to, to relax and uh, fought on Friday nights at the, in the kitchens. And then on Saturday morning, I woke up and said, Jesus Christ, what did we do here? This is dumb. We should go to a public house and drink at home, you know? So they would go to the local neighborhood like the Denison House or the Simpson House or some local pub and they'd get drunk on Saturday night and break up the local pub. And they say, Sunday morning, Jesus is pretty shitty and stupid. And uh, sober up Sunday and go back to work Monday. And they do this week after week after week. Um, I'm the oldest of five kids. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time in the past. It's, it it is really is a long time ago. Uh, uh, you're talking about impaired driving charges. I had five impaired driving charges in Canada. I got my sixth one here in Los Angeles in Burbank. Uh, 
I used to tell there was the one of them. I used to tell like a real kind of like bullshit Hollywood story, you know, with a car chase and and all that shit, you know, and running around the police chasing and sirens and handcuffs and all that stuff. And uh, the truth of that one was, I'm the I think it was the fourth or the fifth. I can't remember. Uh, I just dropped off a whole bunch of drugs. And I was, in, I was making a delivery at three in the morning. And a guy side swiped me in, in this. He had this Primer Gray Super B, and I was in this this a Rambler American that was kind of done over. And uh, and I took off after him, and I cut him at the next light, and I I just kind of like spun around to take the take a chunk out of his fender, and I didn't see the police car pulling up, and I took the front off the police car, <laughs> and uh, took off. <laughs> and I used to tell it like it was like vanishing point, right? Uh, the truth was, I was terrified. Um, I'd, I had multiple impaired driving charges before, violent charges before, and uh, I didn't have a license, I didn't have insurance, I was under suspension, car was full of uh, blow and some other things, and I had a bottle of vodka between my legs, and uh, so I took off, and, what, <laughs> and I was, this is just good, like, this is like a, uh, not a high point, a low point of my drinking, let's a highlighter, a low light. Um, taking off in Toronto. If you knew Toronto, Canada, I was taking off down Bathurst, and the truth was is I pissed myself because I was so frightened I shit myself. Uh, I grabbed the, the, I had all the drugs broken up into quarters, and I went to throw them out the window. The window was closed. <laughs> 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 and, uh, <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> And so I'm crying and screaming and snots coming out my nose and I'm trying to wind up. This window didn't break and I was trying to break it. So I got the shit out of the car and I ended up running into another police car that they put up a roadblock and I, I kind of clipped the car and missed it, went to a car wash, hit some gas pumps, then hit a street car and then hit another police cruiser. And they got me out of the car and... Uh, I was so grateful. They all had their guns, and they said, get out of the car, and I got out, and what was left of the vodka, I figured, they can't get me for an impaired driving charge if they see me drinking after, so the, the breathalyzer thing won't count, so I downed what was left of the vodka and threw the bottle down. I remember that, and it was just about when a guy hit me from behind, and, uh, and that's not, and, and I, and, now you've got to remember, I'm covered in urine, and I've shit myself, right? Uh, they didn't really even want to touch me. But, but they handcuffed me and put me in the back seat of the car. And uh, happy birthday to all that birthday people. Uh, 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 they put me in the back seat of the car, and I forgot. I was sitting there thinking, I think I got this one beat. I remember thinking, it's okay. I'm not going to do time. I'm not going to do time. And I looked over, and just as I did the trunk, they'd opened the trunk of my car, what was left of it and everything. And one of the cops had the spare, and he rolled it up out of the wheel well. And as he did... I flashed that I had a, I had a, a slab of um, Afghani hash in there that was waxed, and it was. And as he rolled the spare up, I could see the hash came up. It was stuck on the tire, and I projectile vomited through the net <laughs> onto the cop in the front seat. He promptly got out of the car, came around, and they got me out, and then spent five minutes putting me back in. And that's the last. That's the last thing I remember. When I came, when I came to the next. The next morning or some hours later, I could see my forehead. I remember that. It was, it was right here. But that, that's, a, like, that's some of my drinking and using, you know. It's, um, I, was not a great, I was not a good drug dealer. Uh, I was a pretty sloppy drunk. Um, drinking and using. I started drinking and using in my teens. Um, I had a full-time job at night when I was 11. Uh, I was a foreman on a, a, when I was 15. I was a precocious little prick. And I remember taking these men that were old enough to be my f grandfather, working-class men that were on their second or even third jobs that they needed to raise a family, and taking them up the in Phillips Electronics, this building was one of the buildings we cleaned, and taking them up to this executive bar that I had keys to because I was like the head of the cleaning, right, and taking these older men in there and explaining them why I was firing them while I poured them a, sh a shot of rye, you know? I can't under I, I would smack me down, man. I can't understand. I, I saw my dad. My dad was down just a couple of weeks ago, and I was sitting there, and I got a flash of some of those moments when I was younger. And uh, God love me. It's a hell of a disease. Uh, I drank and used 
from pretty well I had something in my system, I think, on a daily basis from my mid to early teens until I was 33. Some more of the highlights, lowlights, I won't spend too much time on this, is uh, got, I dated a woman for seven years on the weekends. We got married when she got pregnant. We had a baby, and the marriage lasted 18 months. Um, the little girl's 25 years old now. And um, during that marriage, here's an alcoholic decision, alcoholic thinking. Um, I couldn't drive. It was obvious. I didn't have a driver's license. One of those. <laughs> and I uh, was working a couple of jobs and, and going to this art college and grant monies and doing it. And, uh, and I remember one Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday, you know, middle of the week day, that I had some extra time. I felt like, you know, I was always jammed for time. And I thought, I got a couple of hours here. You know, school's out. I don't have to rush off to work. I know I got the night off work. Olga's at home with a baby, you know, and I, I just went down to the local pub to have a couple of beers, and nothing really happened. You know, I had a few beers, and started, got on the streetcar and headed home around 8 o'clock. And, uh, and got to the corner, and I got off the streetcar, and I was thinking, this is kind of cool not to have to rush, you know, like that. And I don't remember why I opened this evening up, but it was cool. And I got to the corner of the street, keen alcoholic thinking. I realized that my wife's, it hit me, and I don't know how I've forgotten this, but I... Her great-grandmother was in from the Ukraine. And, uh, you know, after the Iron Curtain and all this stuff, they got visas. It took them 10 years to get out of there. And they came over, and they were having dinner at our house. And I was supposed to be home at 5. And that's why I had the evening off. I had forgotten, you know. And I remember standing petrified at the corner of the street. And I just didn't have the heart to show up one more time and say I forgot, you know, with one more lame excuse. So I punched the pole at the corner and broke my hand. And then I went to the local hospital and they called her from the hospital and said, I slipped and broke my hand. I'm, I'm going to be a little late, you know? And she said, are you all right? And I said, yeah, I'll be all right. I'll be okay. And I'll get home. That's alcoholic thinking. My solutions have always been worse than the problem. <laughs> that, during that, um, my wife... My ex-wife, Olga, uh, she became a cop after we separated. She's, uh, <laughs> she's the highest decorated female police officer in Canada. In Canada. Uh, she was the uh, youngest female sergeant in Canadian history. She's now the youngest captain. Um, I owe her a lot. Uh, she is, a, in my opinion, a died in the wall. I don't know, one of those people that hang their shirts in, like, order of length, like short shirts, then longer shirts, then the pants. You used to clean out the ashtray when you're half through your cigarette, you know. Uh, but she did a pretty good job with her daughter, and I didn't get my daughter and spend time with her because my wife, my ex-wife was, uh, was uh, very controlling and very, and, and rightly so, I think, with me near the end. Uh, but uh, when we were together, and I remember one night, I actually got her, and I was, it was great. It was a Saturday night, cause, or, or Wednesday night, because I was watching hockey, and it was just me and my daughter, and we lived upstairs in this duplex, and my sister and my brother-in-law lived downstairs, and I had, I had the baby to myself, you know. And, uh, and I took her into a room that I'd built. I built. I turned this back porch in. We didn't have a lot of money, but I turned this porch into a nursery, and I tucked her in. And as I was leaving the nursery, I realized I'd punched her in her crib. Uh, she was under 18. She was somewhere around 16 months old. Now, I did not go in there to do that. I love and loved my daughter. There's no way. And I thought, I am insane. I am out of my mind. You know, this is not what a sane person does to somebody they love. So I called my sister downstairs, because I knew I was nuts. And I said, Wendy, the baby's sick, and, and I'm sick, and I can't look after her, and I I'm, I'm, can't keep food on me. I'm in the bathroom, and I'm afraid, could you come up and get her? And from that point on, until my sobriety, I became a father at arm's length because I never knew what my behavior was going to be around my daughter. So I'd keep her, you know, out of harm's way. I um, pretty well screwed up a career in Canada. Let's cut to this shit. You know, I drank and used till 1983. I came to Los Angeles after doing a bad drug deal. I borrowed some money off of two groups of people who didn't like each other, who were both very heavy groups of people. And then I gave half the deal away in a blackout. And, uh, and I 
broke into the only person that was still talking to me that had any ways, who was an um, ex-business manager of mine. I broke into his house. He kept all his drugs and cash in the freezer. I took everything that was available and bought an airplane ticket and came to Los Angeles. I'm an actor, and I thought my thinking is that everyone in the world knows I hate Los Angeles. Nobody will ever think of looking for me in Los Angeles. I was here about two weeks, and a guy tapped me on the shoulder in a sleazy little barn and said, Slauko's looking for you. And, uh, and I freaked. And uh, I crashed and burned about four or five months later when nobody else would return phone calls, family wouldn't return. Well, family hadn't talked to me in years. Um, I was like, these, these, you hear up at this podium say, I was physically, morally, spiritually, intellect, intellectually uh, bankrupt. And uh, I was in some, I w and to this day I don't remember. I, I, what I'm reporting, the last six months of my drinking and my first six months of sobriety, what I report, I, there, also everything I said up here is my opinion. This is not, I'm not authority on the program. I'm not authority on alcoholism. I'm not even authority on me. That woman right there is, she's my wife. Uh, she's an authority on me. <laughs> she's been sober nine months longer than me. We've been together 14 years, married 12 years. Her and my sponsor probably knows, my sponsor knows more than Karen, but uh, uh, I'm not an authority, but uh, I was in an apartment in West Hollywood, kind of, I, I, I remember it as a, somebody, some secretary's friend's apartment where I was supposed to water the plants, you know, and, uh, and they gave me a key, and I remember when I got there, I was in such a hurry to get in there because it was daylight, and, uh, and the key didn't fit in the door, so I kicked the door in. And I figure I'll fix it before they get home. And because uh, I'm going to be there about six, seven weeks, right? Or whatever. And I was in there, and uh, that's where I crashed and burned. Um, but six weeks, somewhere in there, six weeks later, I went down. I had I'd come back from a blackout. And blackouts, for anyone that doesn't know, is like, is like the motor's running and you're wandering around and you're not present. You know, it's actually a, a toxic state where the the motor responses keep working, but the conscious mind doesn't, the uh, voluntary processes, um, I think. Um, it's pretty screwed. Um, I had a lot of that. The ones I hated were the 10-minute ones, not the long ones. You know, the day and a half, two-day ones were okay, where you find out you've been to Memphis and you didn't know it, it's okay. But a 10-minute one is really, you know, you'd be sitting there and everything's going great, and it's like blink, and everyone's against the wall, and they're like this. <laughs> and you don't know what you did, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or you're having a business meeting with some guy and you have a couple of scotches because you just put the deal together and blink and you've got him by the tie <laughs> and, his, and his mouth is bleeding. <laughs> These are parts of my past. But anyway, um, I was in this apartment and I, and I, and I, came, I came out of like this fog with a, a glad bag full of blow with about that much in it. Um, 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 a vodka or tequila, I'm not I, I somehow, somehow remember it as tequila and sometimes vodka, but it had a handle. And that's, that's so cool, because in Canada we don't have handles on shit, you know. We did, you can get a half gallon of booze here and have a handle and not drop it, you know. And um, so I had a, a half gallon of this booze, um, clear liquid with a handle, a quarter, quarter filled glad bag, kind of like, you know, those Ziploc bag things. And a bottle of green chartreuse. I remember because it had a cork in it and there was all fuzz on it. You know how bottles get fuzz on them when they're above somebody's kitchen stove or some shit and cooking grease gets on it and the fuzz and the dust? So I'd been in somebody's kitchen. So, <laughs> and, I, and when I went out, I'd been hitting these pe the people that owned this apartment. I'd been hitting their, bank, their little piggy bank, right? And first you take the paper and you'll put it back, right? And then you take the quarters. Then you take the dimes. I was down to penny rolls, man. I was like, they had this big pig that I punched a hole in. And uh, so I went out with penny rolls in my pocket and uh, came back with all this stuff. So obviously um, it would have been a pretty good evening or whatever. And uh, so I started doing it when it was all done. I remember keep looking to see if the sun was up or the moon was up. And when it was all done, it was night. And I, and, and I needed, I went out for cigarettes and I had a whole bunch of these penny rolls. And I went down to the 7-Eleven on, on Santa Monica. And while I was in there, and it occurred to me last year when I was doing my story that maybe this guy wasn't there, but there was a, a, a Hasidic Jewish guy with one of those hats and all the stuff in a 7-Eleven in the middle of the night. And I remember seeing a handful of cash that he was doing something with. And I followed him around, and I was going to hit him and sort of run him down behind the, uh, the dumpsters. 
And just as I'm about to do it, it's not a big deal. It was no big dramatic. I had more dramatic moments of clarity and where I redefined my body before. But I remember thinking, literally, it was like something just grabbed my stomach and twisted. And I was like, this is, this is what I wanted to be when I grew up. You know, I didn't want to be doing this. This is like, you know, I got a, I mean, you know, I was like, I was sweaty. I was yellow. I wore, my butt hadn't closed in six months. You know, I was wearing pampers that you cut down and slipped my pants, you know. I, I was this thing, man. I was like, and, uh, and I got terrified and ran back to this place and went and hid in the, sh in the shower. And uh, somewhere in the next period of time, uh, I don't remember, this person who I'd stopped hanging out with four years before because they were like a real drug reptile. You know, they used all their nails when they, they were doing my drugs. And uh, I won't go into detail, but I thought they had a problem. I didn't want to hang out with them. So I'd stopped hanging out with them four years before. Uh, evidently, I'd called them in the middle of a black hood, this black hood, to see if they could help me get a job because I was unhirable, hadn't worked in like 18 months. And, and, uh, and I was destitute. And... Uh, so I was very surprised when, when they came to the door, uh, this place where I kicked the door in. And uh, now I don't remember anything other than that the, this person's smile hurt. And I'm told that I said, how come you look so good? And, she, and this person said, I haven't done drugs or alcohol in three and a half years. And I said, what are you taking to do that? <laughs> and they probably took me off to a Thursday afternoon meeting at Architects at the improv and I walked into the door and I was at the back it had already started and I didn't want to sit down and I stood beside I had a very noisy head what I remember from that meeting is three things I remember there was this guy beside me who called himself a lushy limey something lodi prick uh, who was dressed in orange pants I think in a purple top or purple pants and an orange top all leather he smelled of way too much cologne and he was louder than my head and uh, Mickey. And uh, the other thing I remember is th during the course of meeting, this guy shared about uh, he was unable to sexually satisfy either his wife, girlfriend, or lover. He was five of something sober, five or six of something sober. And he was suicidal and he's going to kill himself because he couldn't sexually satisfy his person. And everyone was laughing. That's the other thing I remember about that. <laughs> the third thing I remember is at the end of the meeting, everyone started touching each other. And this English prick that was standing beside me said, come on, mate. And I said, F you. And he said, right, F him, and reached in front of me. And I remember distinctly thinking, I'm doing it wrong again. Everyone, you know, not fitting in. Everyone else was doing something. You know, Mickey just reached around in front of me and grabbed the guy across from me. Um, I didn't know it was Mickey until much later on. Um, why I think I remember, like I said, Mickey's, he's louder in my head. And he's distinctive, you know, and he was standing right beside me. Why I remember that guy crying in that meeting and talking about, I mean, sexually, I hadn't satisfied myself or anything in like a couple of years. I mean, <laughs> I, I, the house I had lived in before I came down here, I took all the mirrors and windows out so I couldn't see myself naked. I didn't want to see myself naked, you know? Like I had one of those bodies where you get up the next morning and the belt line's still in your skin, you know, and, and the seams, because the pants are always too tight because you're still getting bloated and bloated and bloated and bloated, you know? And, uh, and the fact, and I got to tell you that he, the fact that he was crying, it was not like one of my cries. I always cried to get sympathy, like one of those snotty, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then you're sort of like, great, I pulled it off, you know? This guy was really crying. And the laughter wasn't laughter at him, it was different. I didn't know what it was. It was like, now I understand it was identification. But at that time, I thought, this is just too out there. And suicide, I understood, because I'd attempted that a few times and failed it. And... Uh, failed at it. And, why are, and, and, the, the, and the, now I understand the Earth Father prayer at the end was like, all my life I was just trying to skate. I just wanted to fit in and at the same time always felt like I couldn't, you know. And that night I showed up at this person's house at three in the morning and I knocked on their door and they came to the door and I said, I'm an alcoholic. And they put their hand over my mouth and said, that's good enough. We'll pick you up tomorrow night. And they did. They took me to my AA meeting the next night. And how I've stayed sober since then, I don't know. That was September 23rd, 1983. How I got it is I got 
Man, I got a sponsor by uh, somebody telling me that that's going to be your sponsor. I didn't know you didn't do what you were told around here, you know? Caroline S. said, that guy over there, um, and I said, he's real loud. And they said, yeah, Peter J., you know, he's going to be your sponsor. I I said, he's going to be your sponsor. And he took me under his, uh, my arm and, and uh, took me under his arm and said, I, I only handle, like, the first or second step with somebody. That's about it. He says, when it gets any more complicated than that, he's going to be your sponsor. And he turned me over to a guy named KLB at about 40 days. And uh, 59 days, all the newcomers I was hanging out with were all loaded. The last one called me and said, I'm whacked. And, and I... I was staying at Kale's place, and I remember taking the phone, the guy, and, and trying to look good on the phone, saying, all right, well, look after yourself. That's cool, that's cool, and hanging up and just smashing the phone, just going nuts, because I, I thought, I'm, I'm not going to make it. You know, I didn't even feel like I was an alcoholic. I felt like I was crazy. I got here crazy. I thought I was copping, you know, like, like I didn't really belong, but I had nowhere else to go. You know, I didn't know where else to go. I just, I thought I was crazy, you know, the shit I had done. And Kale said one of those profound, I remember laying on the floor, I was just like, I, he, let, he stood there, God love this man, and I just went off and ended up on the floor. And, uh, and he said uh, the classic lines we hear, like, maybe all these people got loaded so you can understand you got a killer disease. You know, everything you touch turns to shit, you know. Anyway, I remember, you, I remember him abandoning me, but he probably went to a meeting and left me there. But I was laying on the floor, and I remember feeling hopeless, absolutely hopeless, without hope. And I remember feeling the pressure of the ceiling, you know, it was like, holy shit. And I remember, and I, I rem don't know where it came from because I was not a praying person. I had a bit of an issue with Catholicisms and structured religions and stuff, and I belched up help from somewhere, which I now believe to be my first honest prayer that I'd ever said, and the pressure went the other way. And the next morning, I'm told I got up, and I brought out this big book, and Kale says that, Kale used to every morning read a little bit of the big book, drink some coffee, and sit in his little bathrobe at the kitchen table. So I came out, and you know, you know, this yellow swishy guy, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he said that when I opened my book, it cracked, and I had this little black kung fu jacket I used to run around in, because I didn't have a bathrobe. I sat there, he said it was kind of ugly, <laughs> but uh, he says he didn't have, he waited for 20 minutes. I got a little coffee like Kale and I was imitating him, right? He says he waited about 20 minutes and he reached across the table and turned the book over because I had it upside down. That's how I was trying to look like Kale. This stuff was all reported to me. Uh, I did my force, I, Kale took me for, through the first three steps. He explained it, to him and Peter explained to me that the first step is that I'm, I've got to kill the disease, everything I've touched turned to shit most of my life that a power greater than me, which is me and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the fellowship can um, make things better for me if I'll just turn over that way of doing things in the third step. And if I'm going to turn my life over, I better find out what it is, so put it down on paper so I know what I'm turning over. So I immediately, the, for me, the steps have always been connected. First step leads to the second, which immediately leads to the third, which immediately leads to the fourth. Uh, the third step led to the fourth. I wrote this incredible fourth step, and just around my first birthday, just the week of my first birthday, I went to Kale's to read it, and I, he told me, don't, don't plan on doing your fifth until you've done your fourth. And I said, that's great. And I, wrote, I wrote it all down. <laughs> I mean, I wrote it all down, all of this stuff. I wrote it all down, and I copped out. I, I sat down and opened it and started paraphrasing, and I lied all the way through my fifth step. Now, you know when it says that it's the end of isolation in the fourth step? I know that to be true because when I did that, from the moment I started lying and, and when it was over, he said, that's very good, and he'd kept a list for me, and, and, and all I could do was, like, my head was starting to go, whoa, whoa, you know, as I was lying through this whole thing. We went over and burned it in his sink, and it was all there, <laughs> and, and all that was left in the room was all these lies I'd said for the last 45 to an hour, you know, and... Uh, I know it's that the fourth and fifth step is the end of isolation because when I lied in my first fifth step, I felt so isolated. It increased the isolation. I felt like a pariah. I felt like the worst piece of shit. I was like, beyond, I couldn't even do this simple thing with you guys, and I knew you were my tribe. I knew I belonged here. 
Hale moved about a week later. He got a job and he suggested a sponsor and I got Pat H. And I asked, and how I got Pat H is uh, I kicked, kicked around for a couple of months and with this terror over this fifth step and not being able to go anywhere. And I was going to less and less, spending less time in the meetings. And I was standing at the back of a meeting and this guy, he used to have a blonde comb over and a beard and he was sitting over the front talking and I, some of the shit was making sense. And I got closer and I got closer and I got closer until I could look in his eyes because I wanted to see if he was lying. And he just didn't look smart enough to be making this shit up, you know? <laughs> so when the meeting was over, I went up to him and I said, uh, uh, Kale Brown, you're that Pat H guy. Kale said that I should ask you to be possibly be my sponsor because you both have the same grand, grand sponsor, Jack K. And uh, would you consider working with him, being my sponsor? And he said, yeah, well, let's try for 90 days. And I thought I'd test him. You know, we test somebody with something that's not really that important, see how they're going to react. And I said, I lied all the way through my fifth step with Kale, and I wanted to see what he'd do, because I figured I'd get whacked, and he put his arm around me and said, oh my God, that must really hurt you, poor baby. And I started crying. He's been my sponsor ever since. He's led me through all the steps. He's taught me to pray. I roll out of bed in the morning and do my 11th step. I roll right onto my knees when my bladder doesn't get in the way, that, and I say the third step and the fourth step until I say, stay on my knees until I can get rid through those without my mind wandering. Uh, I sponsor a lot of guys. Uh, I keep it real simple. I'm not a complicated kind of AA guy. Um, I've tried to go to less than three meetings a week. I've really put some effort into going to two. Uh, <laughs> and I got irritable. I just get irritable. I go to a step study, a book study, and a men's stag. Even when I'm on the road, I hit three a week. Um, it's worked out pretty good. I was able to carry the message when I was a year sober to my sister, who was three years younger than me. She's got, she got sober the next year, and the two of us were able to carry it to my brother after her, and he's got, Billy, I have 12, I think, uh, coming up April. Um, the fourth one online is an overreader. He just sits in the basement with the babies and guitar, and, and he's a sweetheart of an artist and everything like that, but he never goes out in life. He's like a house husband, so I can't really... He, he once said to us, I don't know if I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I don't have stories like you. My sister lovingly said, you know, Robbie, if you ever got out of the house, you might have a goddamn story. <laughs> and, uh, and my younger sister, Beverly, uh, 14 years younger than me, she married, she liked pickup, no, tow truck guys, you know, and guys she'd meet in coffee shops and stuff. And got one kid and... She used to get beat up a lot, and uh, she'd beat up a lot, and uh, didn't want none of that goddamn AEA, you self-righteous son of a bitch, as she called us and everything. And um, had one little baby, Arthur, and he started getting older, and she met a guy who I never met sober, Howie. And uh, they got married, and they were hammered out of their minds. At the wedding, he came up to me and put his arm around me, and in all sincerity said, don't ever worry about sister. He, he fixed his cars. He said, if... Uh, if I ever lose my job, I can always deal drugs, you know. And uh, so obviously I didn't look like my story, you know. And um, he started doing some shit with guns and stuff around the house. They live in a farmhouse two years ago, a year and a half ago. And I'd like to say I'm the most spiritual person in the world, but I got so frightened I thought of getting him killed. I really did. He, from all intent, put, fired a shotgun through the baby's bedroom door and... And I, I mean, God, I didn't know how to let somebody else have a spiritual path, you know. And uh, truth is, is uh, how I got a year in July, and Wendy and Beverly got a year this July. They're coming up on a year and a half, just over a year and a half now. Kids are fine. I would have killed the wrong guy because I never got to meet Howie until he got sober, and he's an absolute sweetheart. Uh, that little girl that um, I punched in her crib when she was under 18 months old. When I first got sober, her mother would not, I was not allowed to see her. You ever, you, ever, anyone ever try to get into a detox, you know, where you kind of phone every day at a certain time to make sure you qualify? Well, that's the way I got to see my daughter last year on my drinking and using. I had to phone every day at 4 o'clock so I could get her for a half day on the weekend, supervised. And I didn't always make it. And when I got sober, nobody gave a shit. And uh, I got to see her supervised when I was nine months sober. And then she got to be with me unsupervised for a weekend when I was a year and half, I think it was. Then she got to come down supervised and visit me here for a week when I was two years sober. Three years sober, she got to be here unsupervised for a whole summer. 
And when I was five years sober, her mother suggested that she move in with me because our house seemed more emotionally stable than hers. And she has two and a half years of sobriety right now. Um, I met my wife on my first sober anniversary. We moved in together on my second. We got married on the third. And 20 days ago, we had Finley Cater Ironside. Oh. And I'll wrap it up with this, you know, talking about the inventory stuff and everything. I always kind of shortchanged myself on a lot of things, you know. Fuck. I'm, this is what Japanese call, I think, crying for happy. <laughs> oh, um, I, I can love. I mean, you were talking about touching people. I can love. I mean, and I know people love me. And uh, and the other day, I had Finley on my chest, and I called her Adrian. That's my daughter, my first daughter's name. Who's uh, getting? Get. I mean, we're like a family. We're a family. Our, our little Christmas greeting this year is the Karen and I and the baby and, and Adrian, the Ironside family, and it's going up. You know. Uh, so I'm just going to keep going to my three meetings a week and sponsoring guys and uh, stopping and thinking before I do things. Thanks. Okay, this has been another typical Saturday night meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now we will have announcements from our secretary, Willis. I'm Willis, I have alcoholism. Willis. This anchor speaker's got a lot on mic for sharing. <laughs> they did a great job. Uh, special welcome to the newcomers. Could you please stand again so we can get better acquainted with you? I wrote down your names. Don't freak out. I'll destroy the list. Andy, Trish, see, I can't read. Casey, Scott, Larry, Bill, Maria, Suzanne, Brian, John, John, Bob, Ozzy, and Robin. Welcome. We have newcomer chair people, Terry and Nancy. Let's congratulate the birthday people and welcome the out-of-towners. A literature person is Ken. I'm Ken, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Ken. Hi. Right. We've got a full collection of literature up here. We've got the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is our basic text. Um, a lot of other uh, books, the hard uh, cover books we sell at our cost. The pamphlets are free. I've got meeting directories, um, and we've got flyers for the upcoming San Fernando Valley AA convention in uh, February, which is a great convention, and plenty of other things. So come up afterwards if you're interested. Thanks. Uh, we taped this meeting, but the tape guy had to leave early. But uh, uh, if you need a tape or something, you have to show up next week or tell me or something. We'll make a list, something. You're going to do the list? Well, then stand up and make the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, please clean up around your area and help stack the chairs. Don't drag them on the floor. It leaves marks. Our cleaner person is Joe.
Ian Chester. Our chair wrangler is also Matt. <laughs> Uh, there's another meeting after this meeting at the Michael Landon Center across from Pepperdine, seven miles south on PCH at 1030. It's a candlelight meeting. It's really good. Uh, a couple people have wondered if there was going to be meetings the next two weeks on the 26th and the 2nd of January, and this there are going to be meetings here. So anyway, parking lot closes at 10 o'clock, so we need to thank our speakers who got here before that. Let's thank the mighty Tom Fly for leading the meeting. <laughs> I'd like to thank Aaron, my co-secretary, <laughs> and thank you for letting me be of service. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to thank um, Moira for reading Moira for reading Chapter Five, Joe for reading the Twelve Traditions. Uh, court cards will be signed by myself for the co-secretary, Aaron, at the podium after the meeting. After a moment of silent meditation for the alcoholic who still suffers, we'll, um, can lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. an hour in his office in 1963 is to have come here with a clean head with an un with an unhindered head in reality and learn to live in reality and that's what a is about that's what these steps are about we're running a little late but I want to uh, one of those birthday people taste talk 10 seconds over time that's why uh, <laughs> there he is right over there I just want I just want to close by saying something. I, it's kind of an interesting little thought, I think. People say, well, how does AA work? And it's very easy to say, chapter five, there it is. <laughs> but they don't mean how it works. They mean, why does it work? And I'm sure everybody in this room has the question from time to time, why does this work? There are much better things that don't work. Why does this work? And I think of the old story as kind of an analogy. In the 1700s, the worst disease that could happen, that was happening in the world was smallpox, the most lethal. I mean, bubonic plague was bad, but that only came once every few hundred years. Smallpox came quite often. And they just wipe out cities and areas. In Philadelphia, I remember reading books about wagons just going through, bring out your dead, and just throw your body, your mother and dad's body in there and hope you won't get it. They had no idea what germs were, bacteria. In London, a doctor named, doctor named Edward Jenner Notice the funny thing. He says, the funny thing. Girls who milk cows don't get smallpox. Now, why the hell should that be? Why should girls who's, who smell, milk cows? And he talked to them all, and he finally realized they'd all had something called cowpox, which was kind of a mild inflammation they got. And he thought, that's the only thing they have in common. But there's no, because they didn't understand germs or bacteria. They thought 
diseases were caused by air, by the moon, by all sorts of things. But he bought a little boy named Jimmy Phipps, nine years old, and he took him down to the smallpox, uh, where the girls had cowpox, cut a little hole in his arm, and took pus off the girl with cowpox and rubbed it in there. Thought maybe that will give it to him. And of course he got cowpox. Then he got better. Then he took him down to the smallpox death ward where they're dying of smallpox. Cut a little hole in his arm, rubbed some pus from someone dying. And the boy got smallpox briefly and got better. And that day they realized that's how you keep from getting cow smallpox, you get cowpox. Nobody knew why for 150 years after that, but they do that. So they began giving people cowpox by rubbing cowpox in their arm. Here's an interesting thought to take home with you. The Roman word for cow is vacus. That's where the term vaccination comes from, insertion of the cow. About 100 years later, 150 years later, they finally discovered bacteria and germs. Oh, yes. It turns out smallpox sets up antibodies that prevent smallpox from killing you. Oh, that's nice. But a lot of people would have been dead waiting for that to understand why. And I th I sometimes that's the thing about AA. I don't know why AA works. Maybe someday, 150 years from now, some wise man will discover that a series of actions and beliefs, when done in a proper order under proper auspices, set up a flood of endorphins to the cerebral cortex or some goddamn thing. I don't know. <laughs> But I know I can't afford to wait to find out. <laughs> I know that this works. And if you're new tonight, there's always going to be people who say, A is, a is for your drinking, but you got to do some other things for your emotions. Once upon a time, I was committed to spend the rest of my life in the Texas State Insane Asylum in Big Spring, Texas. I've been in four veterans' hospitals in locked psychiatric wards. I've been in a psychiatric Navy ward. I've been chained down. I think I can speak on behalf of those who are emotionally disturbed. <laughs> Speaking on behalf of those who are emotionally disturbed, let me say this. No matter what anybody tells you, I can tell you from personal experience, AA as it is, if you run with the winners and do the things and allow yourself to surrender, will work at least for 40 years and three weeks. I don't know about any longer than that, but it'll work that long. Do it. Thank you, Clancy. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Clancy. This has been another typical Saturday night meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now we will have an announcement from our secretary, Willis. I'm Willis. I have alcoholism. Let's thank our speakers again. Tanya in there, always lovely Clancy. <laughs> did a great job. Uh, special welcome to the newcomers. Could you please stand again so we get better acquainted with you? I wrote down your names, don't freak out. I got Rich, Brian, Rob, Shell, I think I got that wrong. Mark, Sasha, Sean, Chuck, Bob, Ken, Robin, Glenda, Ad Adrian, Joan, and Zach. Welcome. We welcome you to make this a regular meeting after you get out of lockdown or wherever you are. Um, we have newcomer chair people, Terry and Elizabeth. Let's congratulate the birthday people and welcome the out-of-towners. Our literature person is Ken. Hi, my name's Ken. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Ken. It's got a lot of literature up here. Uh, my first speaker talked about a $14,000 big book. I've got it for six fifty, dollars um, And less, uh, if, if you're new and you, need, uh, you don't have the money for one, come see me about that. We've got directories. They have a list of the thousands of meetings in the LA area every week. Um, a lot of pamphlets. The pamphlets are free. And I was specifically asked to bring to your attention the brochures we have up here for the San Fernando Valley AA convention in February. Uh, it's a great convention. 
and lots of other things. So come see me afterwards if you're interested. Thanks. We make and sell tapes at this meeting. Our tape person is Chris. Please clean up around your area and help stack the chairs.